there. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of this, along with Jeff Napolitano, who is from the AFSC. I am with the Real Cost of Prisons Project, and we both thought um, Northampton needed a response uh, to what has happened or happening in Ferguson. So we're organized, organized this tonight. Uh, we are going to start. We're going to start. Um, the the Brown family asked that every rally and every protest begin with four and a half minutes of silence um, in honor to honor Michael Brown and the four and a half hours that he laid out in the street in Ferguson. So before we do any talking, or any more talking, um, we are gonna have four minutes of silence, a chance for us to think about what's been going on and how we wanna move forward. I would like to start off with a chant that goes indict, convict, send that killer cop to jail. The whole damn system is guilty as hell. Indict, convict, send that killer cop to jail. The whole damn system is guilty as hell. Indict, convict, send that killer cop to jail. The whole damn system is guilty as hell. Indict, convict. Every 28 hours, a black person is killed in this country by police or vigilantes like George Zimmerman acting as the police. This is Mike Brown, but this is not only about Mike Brown. This is about all of the lives that have been lost and all of the lives that have been criminalized. And in the words of Eric Garner, who was killed by the NYPD, we say enough is enough, and this ends today. I'm glad to see the people all turned out today. But I want to remind people that this is a movement, this is not a moment, and that we must continue to act and continue to fight and continue to struggle um, until we see an end to this police terror. Um, they are an occupying force in our communities and we do not need them. And what I saw was that this country has declared war on young black people and um, it is unacceptable. Um, and I want to comment briefly because a lot of people have raised criticisms of um, the, the violence um, since uh, Officer Darren Wilson was not indicted. For more than two decades, the Smith College School for Social Work has held an anti-racism commitment that calls us to identify and critically analyze and intervene against the injurious effects of racism. This commitment urges us to speak out against the kinds of systemic racism and oppression playing out in the current events in Ferguson. Violation of basic human rights, the criminalization of people of color, particularly young men of color, and the institutionalized and too often lethal violence perpetrated against them with seeming impunity has sparked outrage in Ferguson, in our nation, and across the world as clinical social workers invested in social justice we aim to bear witness to the grief, loss, and collective pain and rage these events have provoked. As a school for social work with an explicit commitment to working against racism, we are committed to exposing the forces of structural oppression and injustice that result in violence and dehumanization across all relationships. As members of this community, we stand with all of you. We call our school community to engage in critical dialogue about the systemic forces, race and racism that shape us, impact our neighbors, and construct our relationships with one another. Investigation and analysis of how these dynamics affect our own communities. And social and political action to provoke systemic change that promotes justice, safeguards human rights, and ensures fair and equitable treatment and respect for human dignity for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suchini Reddy. 
and she is on the advisory board of Just Communities. Hey, Sir Jimmy. Good evening, everyone. When Lo can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. When Lois asked me to speak earlier today, I thought I wasn't sure if I could do it because I'm feeling really fucked up. Um, I'm really, I'm, I was, you know, I'm feeling fucked up that a system that was founded on genocidal violence and anti-black racism continues to condone the murder of our black and brown youth every 28 hours. Um, and Mike Brown, as we've heard tonight, he's not the exception, but he's the rule. And this is a society we live in, and that's fucked up. And I feel it, like, I feel it, my heart, my heart is like right where my skin is. It's like about to explode, right? But I realized after I got off the phone with Lois that I wasn't just feeling fucked up, I was also feeling really stirred up. And I'm stirred up because every now and then, right, this space opens up where our righteous rage and our disciplined despair, our wounds basically turn into righteous rage and disciplined despair. And there's this mass mobilization led by youth in Ferguson, led by the people in Ferguson that shut down all the bridges in New York City last night. Right? right? There is, we are standing in the midst of a moment of real possibility. Right, to end business as usual. And that's why we're gathered here today. And we're faced with doing better than indicting one man, one murderer. We're here tonight to indict a system based on genocidal violence. Indict the system. And that's the opportunity. I wasn't waiting. I was not waiting for the indictment of Darren Wilson, even though that is necessary. I am waiting for us to indict this system. Yeah. Right? Right. And this is our moment to rise up to the challenge of undoing the system where privilege is protected by the state-sanctioned violence uh, against murder, actually, of black and brown youth. So whether you feel personally, um, personally impacted, I was like, I can't read my own handwriting. Whether you feel personally impacted or not, this is about you, right? This violence, this murder is the flip side of security. Right. And that's actually, and I, so Lois asked me to speak around immigration, so I'm going to make the connection right here, because the other, last week when President Obama told us all in his long-awaited speech announcing administrative relief for some undocumented immigrants who are the parents of citizens or legal permanent residents and who have been in the United States within a certain time frame, he also, the details of that, right, the details of that are pretty specific, and you might want to do some research on it, but... In that speech, President Obama drew the line around who is included and who is excluded when he said, and I'm quoting him, right? That, well, he said border security and immigration enforcement was for, and here's the quote, it was for felons, not families. Mm -hmm. For criminals, not children. Mm -hmm. My jaw dropped when I heard those words. Criminals, not children. What do you have to say, Mr. President, to all of our children who are criminalized, who are black and brown and murdered in cold blood. When he said that, I was taken back to 1999, when the NYPD shot Amadou Diallo 41 times in cold blood. Amadou Diallo was murdered while he was pulling a wallet out of his pocket. He was murdered because in New York City, for a young black man to pull a wallet out of his pocket, it's assumed that he's pulling a gun. And he was shot 41 times because to be a young bland, a black man in New York City was to be seen as a criminal, not as a human being. I bring up Diallo because he is an immigrant from West Africa, right? He's from Guinea. He was black and an immigrant. A reminder that those struggles, the struggles for migrant justice and the struggles against mass criminalization and the murder of young black and brown youth are one in the same, right? They're not the same, but they're related. <laughs> the murder of black and, um, so as we stand here ready to struggle until we not only indict the system of racist genocide, but we undo it, we have to stand ready to make the demand that we include all of us, not some of us. 
All of us. All of us or none of us. All of us. All of us or none of us. Right? All of us or none of us. That's what I'm here to say. Well, just is no peace. I want to introduce Savan Melis Myung and her son, Vicent. to me. Sometimes I don't know what to say when I speak after him, so I'd like to kind of say a little bit, because he is freaking amazing. So, in any case, um, <laughs> let, yeah, last night when I found out about the indictment, or lack thereof, um, I was in my friend Vera's house, and she, where she had no, <laughs> no internet, <laughs> no TV. That's right. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it was just amazing how, with all that, we still found out what happened. So that just tells you that this is a movement that's not going nowhere, yeah. right? Yeah. So I see your faces here and I have one question for you. Have, whites especially, have you talked to your children about your privilege? That's a really good question for you to ask yourself and recognize what that looks like because we can't understand it sometimes. So in any case, I, I posted on my Facebook today because I'm a Facebooker. Um, I'm sure you all are too. So I, I posted and I said, I've been in a grand juror, I've, I've been a grand juror before and I can attest that every single one of those um, uh, cases that were presented to us, every single one of them was indicted to go into trial. Now, granted, none of them was a murder uh, incident. However, every one of them went to trial. Think about that. So, I can't even imagine how many of those cases were black. Because names are very similar to me. John Smith, Mike Brown, I can't tell whether or not they're black or brown, or white. So, in any case, um, to those that are urging people to uh, get along, well, th they must understand that they too have to talk about race, raci racism, white supremacy, and what that looks like, because the one, that, the one thing that continues to be hazardous to our kids is the fact that they, that they, that, that are teaching about racism do not see race or color, especially those who are of color. So for that, this actually reminds me of Rodney King and what happened then. So really, this whole thing of not doing anything from systematically and not having any change systematically is having the history repeatedly repeat itself, right? So repeat after me, repeatedly repeat itself. Repeatedly repeat itself. What are you gonna do about that? Stop it. Minister Charles Stokes. <laughs> peace everybody. Peace. I said peace everybody. Peace. It's not as bad as it seems. The outlook isn't that bleak. We just have to stand together. I've mean, heard a lot of people speak tonight very eloquently about police brutality, uh, racism, and all of those things. And they ask how it starts. As a nine-year-old going to Van Sickle, because I was very hyperactive and I couldn't move, they put me in a program called Chapter 766 for young black children who were not able to conform to the rules and regulations of the classroom. And then from there, they begin to marginalize me and disenfranchise me with labels. I was thinking about labels on the way here. And I watched Darren Wilson, the murderer who murdered Michael Brown, how he talked about Michael Brown. He said in his words, and I quote, I felt like a five-year-old being grabbed by the incredible awe. He said uh, he feared 
for his life with a gun. It is easy to label people who you don't know. It is easy to disenfranchise and marginalize black males. As I look out in the audience and I listen to all the eloquent speakers, no one was a black male, except for my brother Eddie here, who really understands walking into a subway and people stop. Even the people who profess that they're not racist. Even for the people who support black life. And this lady touched on a very well topic, white supremacy. White supremacy is a disease that says, because of the color of my skin, I am better than you. When our country was founded during the Douglas-Lincoln debate, Douglas said this, America was to be a country for white people and by white people, and all other non-white people were to be the burden bearers for the true citizens of this nation. My plea goes out to all the well-intended white folk who really can make a matter. Unfortunately, apathy has struck the black community. We have very few and far in between who really can stand up and fight this fight. Going under 500 years of oppression, 375 years of physical sl uh, slavery really takes a toll on the human psyche. We are a people who are seriously suffering under the disease of white supremacy. The cure for white supremacy is white people must begin to have a conversation with other white people telling them that racism is wrong.
that came out. I hope, as we've all said, that this isn't the one time that we see you until some other horrendous thing happens and then we all appear here again like we did a year or so ago for Trayvon Mark. So let this be the beginning Yes. And let's have a commitment, commitment that this is a place to go from, to integrate these ideas into action and to integrate them into your life every single day. Uh, so again, the next thing is don't spend a single penny on Black Friday weekend. Black and blue. And I also want to say one more thing. Every 28 hours, a black person in this country is killed, but every 32 hours, a trans person is killed in this country. That's um, So, um, this is important, and I want to say that every single night for the last 109 nights, um, it's been like this in Ferguson. But this, we got bars. Um, separating us. Um, they got tear gas and batons. They got helicopters and SWAT tanks. Um, they got police uh, rubber bullets shooting people in the face. So I urge you um, to step up your commitment um, to ending injustice. And um, I urge you to tell everyone to indict.